This program is not for young children to watch alone. When children see and hear about frightening things, it's best for them to have an adult close by, somebody who loves them and can put their arm around them. So please get a grown-up that you love to watch this program with you, because we're going to talk about some sad and scary things. Today, on a very special episode of Blame It on George, we'll be continuing our look into children's shows that diverted from their usual formula in order to give their young viewers some insight into some real problems. These are 10 more episodes of kid shows that dealt with serious issues. Virgil deals with Richie's racist father on Static Shock. Hey, Dad. This is my friend Virgil. Remember, I told you about him. Not nearly enough. Static Shock was an animated series set in the DC animated universe that ran on WB Kids. The main character, Virgil, dealt with many supervillains, thieves, and other standard superhero fare. However, one episode had him deal with a more realistic problem. In the episode Sons of the Fathers, Virgil wonders why his friend, Richie, never invites him over to his house. He sort of pushes Richie into inviting him over, so he does, but only while his father is at home. Everything goes fine until his dad gets home and begins making derogatory comments about and towards Virgil. And now I see why Richie acts like a hood, Maggie. That kid's a bad influence. All his kind are. Keep your voice down. It's bad enough I gotta deal with them all day long. Now one of them's in my house. He tries to ignore it at first, but it becomes too much and he goes home leading to Richie lashing out at his father and running away. Virgil, his father, and Richie's father all work together reluctantly to find Richie, learning about each other more through the journey. At the end, Richie's father changes his racist way of thinking and decides to listen to his son more. What your son heard, Hawkins. I wasn't talking about him. No, you were talking about his kind, that's all. The title of this episode is a reference to the phrase sins of the fathers, which is a biblical concept where sins or inequalities are passed from one generation to the other. It's, of course, ridiculous to judge a son for his father, but despite that, Richie feels guilty for being the son of someone so racist. This episode handled the situation in a very real and believable way, despite being set in a superhero story. Boris is addicted to drugs in Captain Planet. <laughs> Nothing can bring you down now. Captain Planet was a cartoon that ran from 1990 to 1992 and mostly focused on teaching children about the dangers of pollution and how they can help to save the environment. While many of the episodes were rather in your face with their delivery of the message, the message was nevertheless a good and important one, as our environment needs our help now more than ever. The first episode of the second season, Mind Pollution, shifted the focus away from the environment and instead focused on another issue. In this episode, Linka is visiting Washington to see her uncle Dimitri and cousin Boris. It soon becomes very evident that Boris is addicted to drugs, specifically a drug called Bliss, that causes one's eyes to turn red, laugh maniacally, and feel no pain. This drug is being dealt by the villainous verminous scum, a recurring villain who was originally voiced by Jeff Goldblum. Eventually, Boris actually drugs Linka with Bliss, in an attempt to steal her ring so he can exchange it for more Bliss. Linka becomes addicted, and all the addicts turn into zombies of some sort. The other Planeteers arrive to help stop Scum, and here are where things get pretty dark. Boris throws himself through a window to allow the other addicts inside, where the Planeteers are barricading themselves, causing his arms to bleed out quite heavily. He actually then overdoses and dies on screen. Bliss killed him. I'm sorry. No, you are lying. Boris, it's me, Linka. Wake up. Linka, he's dead. No, no, no. Oh, dealer. <laughs> Captain Planet shows up, beats the hell out of scum, and the day is saved. As the episode ends, we are treated to an anti-drug PSA and are left alone with our thoughts, knowing we just saw a child overdose and die on Captain Planet. Although the episode uses a fake drug and a supervillain that turns them into zombies, 
it still feels very real and comparable to real life drugs and addiction. This was a particularly dark episode in an innocent series about environmentalism and pollution, with its episode name even alluding to its departure from the usual formula, mind pollution. Stephanie learns about child abuse on Full House. The episode Silence is Not Golden aired on February 16, 1993. In this episode, Stephanie is paired up with an annoying classmate named Charles for a writing assignment, much to her dismay. After spending time together, she discovers that his father abuses him. My dad never hits me. Does yours hit you? No, just, just, just forget it. Let, let's do the assignment. Look, thing is, my dad does hit me sometimes, but it's my own fault for ticking him off. Boy, did he really clap at me last week. You mean when you came to school with that black guy and you said you walked into a door? Yeah, a door named Dad. With his mother having passed away, he feels helpless and unable to do anything about the situation. Later on, Michelle becomes upset at their father and complains about it to Stephanie. She becomes angry and says that she should be happy she doesn't have a father who hits her. She ends up telling the adults about Charles' abuse, which leads them to call the police on the father. Listen, sweetheart, I know you want to keep your promise, but if you know this is happening and you don't say anything about it, you're only helping it happen again. But what'll happen to Charles if we report it? What'll happen to Charles if we don't? Charles ends up being sent to a foster home, safe now from his violent father. At first, Stephanie feels bad that she broke the promise she made to Charles to not tell anybody about the abuse. However, Jesse says that she did the right thing and that thanks to her, Charles is safe tonight. The episode ends with John Stamos and Jody Sweeten coming out and talking directly to the viewers, encouraging them to speak up if they suspect that someone is being abused. Full House is no stranger to approaching serious issues, but they always present them in a context that makes them feel safe and manageable. Hopefully this episode encouraged people to start looking at situations a bit more carefully and recognizing signs of child abuse. Mr. Rogers talks about divorce. Did you ever know any grown-ups who got married and then later they got a divorce? Well, it is something that people can talk about and it's something important. I know a little girl and a little boy whose mother and father got a divorce and those children cried and cried. You know why? Well, one reason was that they thought it was all their fault. But of course it wasn't their fault. A very serious issue that can affect a child's mental health is divorce, with various factors tying in, such as a child's understanding of the concept and the parents' handling of the situation. On February 16, 1981, an untitled episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood aired that discussed divorce and helped children understand it a bit better. The episode begins with Mr. McFeely stopping by with a piece of music he found, leading him and Mr. Rogers to play the song on the piano. The song reminds McFeely of his wedding day. The conversation then turns to how some people aren't always happy together, which leads to divorce. The episode then goes on to show Prince Tuesday learning that another girl's parents are divorced. He then worries that a little argument could lead parents down the same path. Strangely, the conversation then switches to about machines, because machines don't have feelings, but people do, and that you will always be a person with feelings. Prince Tuesday said he'd like to be a machine and not have any feelings. But when you're born, you're a person. You're not a machine. Machines just do the same things over and over and over again. But when you're a person, you can grow and change and feel. Despite the episode focusing on divorce, it doesn't spend too much time on it, only about half the episode. However, whenever it does, it handles the topic in an extremely classy and respectful way, in usual Mr. Rogers fashion. It teaches children that the feelings of a parent may change, but your feelings matter as well in the midst of all this confusion. Penny deals with gender equality in the Proud family. 
An issue that has plagued society since its birth has been sexism and gender equality. Even now, though we've made great strides in advancements, it's still a prevalent problem. In 2001, an episode of Disney's The Proud Family was released that dealt with this issue head on. Titled She's Got Game, the episode focused on Penny attempting to impress a boy, which eventually leads her to try and join the school football team. However, she is met with immediate sexism as the coach refuses to let a girl join his team and suggests she go be a cheerleader or bake cake. Excuse me, young lady. I think you got the wrong feel. The cheerleaders are over on the other side. No, I'm here to try out for the football team. Sure, baby doll. You tried. Now get off the field before you get hurt. I'm not leaving. There's no rule that says that I cannot play on the boys' team. However, there are plenty of rules that say you cannot call me baby doll. The other teammates are no better and mock Penny for trying to get on the team. After a court order is set up by her friend Zoe's mother, Penny is allowed onto the team, but the coach still refuses to let her in the game. Hey, you biscuit head coach! Put my grandbaby in the game! At the game, Sugar Mama shouts through a microphone to let Penny play, which the audience joins in on. Eventually, she is put in the game, but injures herself after scoring a touchdown. Penny laments that she was unable to win the game, but her mother reassures her that she won so much more. Though it's a small step, the issues tackled in this episode are an important step. Despite being a simple sport that anyone can play, football has become male-dominated and is often unwelcoming to women seeking to play the sport. Of course, one could replace football with almost anything in this episode, and the message would remain the same. Gender inequality runs rampant throughout society, even today, but this episode shows that you can make a difference no matter how small. Sesame Street features a new Muppet with autism. Sesame Street has been educating children in a fun and engaging way for almost 50 years now, and they're still breaking new ground as of this year. Released on April 10th, 2017, this episode focused on Big Bird meeting a new Muppet named Julia. Hi, Julia. I'm Big Bird. Nice to meet you. Oh, Julia? Elmo and Abby introduce him to her, but she doesn't respond when he greets her. In fact, Julia doesn't seem to respond at all when Big Bird says anything to her, which causes him to worry that she doesn't like him. Alan reassures Big Bird that that's not the case. Julia has autism and acts and responds differently than others. After understanding her a bit better, they all begin to play until a siren goes off. This upsets Julia, which Big Bird doesn't realize. He continues playing and tags her, which causes her to become even more upset. Alan takes her away to have a calming break, but Big Bird feels bad about upsetting her. Elmo and Abby reassure him that it wasn't his fault and that she'll be okay. Big Bird tells the others that he's never met anyone like Julia before, but that he has tons of friends, all kinds of friends, and would like to be friends with her as well. And when she returns, they all continue to play together. After Sesame Street moved to HBO, new episodes usually aired on PBS about nine months after they aired on HBO. However, despite that being the current deal, this episode aired on HBO and PBS at around the same time, likely due to the importance of teaching this information to children now, instead of holding it off. Steven Universe touches on abusive relationships. Hailed as one of the most progressive cartoons of all time, Steven Universe has been touching on sensitive and important issues since its creation. From deconstructing gender roles to showcasing openly LGBT relationships and characters, the show has gained a large following not only for its wonderful storytelling and characters, but by how the issues are woven into the narrative instead of having a very special episode dedicated to them. One of these issues that was discussed was abusive relationships, which had been building up for about a season and a half. In the episode Alone at Sea, Stephen and his father Greg take the gem Lapis Lazuli with them on a boating trip in an attempt to make her feel included and accepted on Earth. Prior to this, Lapis had sacrificed herself by fusing with the villainous gem Jasper and holding her prisoner at the bottom of the ocean. Lapis has a tough time letting herself relax and admits that she can't stop thinking about everything that happened with Jasper. Stephen reassures Lapis that she doesn't have to deal with Jasper anymore, but to his surprise she actually says she misses her. I'm really trying to enjoy it out here, but I can't stop thinking about being fused as Malachite. How I used all my strength to hold her down in the ocean, how I was always battling against Jasper to keep her bound to me. But it's not like that anymore. 
You don't have to be with Jasper. That's not it. I, I miss her. What? Jasper then attacks the boat and pleads with Lapis to fuse again. She felt stronger and more powerful when it was the two of them. Jasper begs, saying that Lapis changed her and it would be different this time. It'll be better this time. I've changed. You've changed me. I'm the only one who can handle your kind of power. Together, we'll be unstoppable. However, Lapis rejects her, saying she never wants to feel what she felt when they were together again. After defeating Jasper, the three of them go home with Lapis having some closure over the past. In Steven Universe, gems fuse to create a powerful entity made up of two of them or sometimes with even more gems. While it serves a purpose in battle, fusion is often depicted as symbolism for deep friendship, love, and even sexual intimacy. This was one of the first depictions of showing a gem fuse against their will, thus creating the commentary on abusive relationships. While Lapis is able to move away from this situation for the most part, Jasper is deeply affected by it and begins inflicting this same sort of unwanted fusion on other gems. Sharon is pressured with underage drinking and Braceface. An often forgotten early 2000s cartoon was Braceface, a Canadian show that focused on a girl with braces struggling to get through her teen years. It was produced by American actress Alicia Silverstone, who also voiced the main character for the first two seasons. The season one episode, Miami Vices, gives us a situation that doesn't have much to do with braces, but is still a prevalent issue many teens experience, underage drinking and peer pressure. In this episode, our titular brace face Sharon gets invited by her dad to come visit him in Miami. We quickly see that her father has way less rules than her mother and is much more lenient and cool. She goes to see her father's band practice and learns that they all drink pretty casually. A friend of the band invites Sharon to a party, which she and Maria later attend that night. They get offered a rum and coke, which Maria turns down, but Sharon decides to drink. And throughout the night, Sharon has around five drinks, and it really shows. She acts like a total idiot. Some weird stuff happens with her braces where they connect to the speakers, and her father hears their entire conversation, learning that she got drunk. At the hotel, Sharon vomits, and her father gives her a good talking, saying how dangerous and stupid it is for someone her age to drink. It puts her in a situation where she could be taken advantage of or get herself hurt. Braceface aired on the Disney Channel in America, so it's very interesting to see a show discuss and show an underage character drinking alcohol in a Disney show. Nevertheless, they do a fine job showing the bad sides of drinking, such as poor behavior, hangovers, and vomiting. While the drinking PSA does come a bit out of nowhere towards the end of the episode, it's still a fine way to introduce kids to it and showcase the dangers that come alongside with it. TJ meets a pedophile on Smart Guy. In the 80s and 90s, family sitcoms were all over the place. Some could say that there was an oversaturation of the genre, but despite that, people managed to fall in love with these shows. One of these shows was Smart Guy, which aired in the late 90s on the WB. The show followed the exploits of a child genius named TJ Henderson. With this being the late 90s, the internet had just started to gain popularity and people didn't fully understand what came along with it like we do now. The episode Strangers on the Net focuses on TJ meeting a friend in an online chat room who turns out to actually be a pedophile. TJ begins pirating games online with the friend he met on the chat room, and soon enough the friend tells him that he has a great new game but can only give it to TJ in person. He goes over to the guy's house only to find out that he is a middle-aged man. At first, TJ is weirded out, but the man assures him that he is cool and invites him inside for milk and cookies. Turns out the man is a game developer and wants TJ to be in his new game, which sounds awesome to him. The game is a surfing game, and in order to get the animations, the man needs TJ to pose in front of a green screen. However, since this is a surfing game, the man asks TJ to take off his shirt. The only thing that's weird is... See, you're surfing in your sweaters and jeans. It sort of ruins the reality of this. You really ought to be in swimsuits. That may be winter wear in Hawaii, but not DC, which stands for darn cold. <laughs> but you're wearing underwear, right? I mean, boxers are just like jams. That might work. What do you think? Naturally, he is weirded out by this, but the man claims that it's totally fine, and he has a photo album of kids doing the same thing. Uh, this is Melissa. She's your age, and the first time she came here, she was nervous too. 
but she got comfortable and started getting into it. And before you knew it, she was surfing with her shirt off. I thought you said that we were the first to try this game. Oh, you are, for this version. I've had to redo it several times, you know, to get the bugs out. I haven't let anybody try this version. Come on, who wants to catch a wave? You don't have to take off your pants, just take off your shirt. TJ finally gets what's going on here, runs home to tell his parents, and the man is arrested. While it has good intentions, this is an extremely simplified version of this situation and could falsely give off the idea that child predators are extremely obvious and easy to avoid. This is, of course, not the case, and the children who would watch a show like this shouldn't be led to assume that. Mr. Rogers talks about violence and shootings. There are people in the world who are so sick or so angry that they sometimes hurt other people. And they're usually the ones who end up in the news. Another rare episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood exists that most people likely have never seen. In this case, discussing violence and shootings the episode was created in response to another assassination, John Lennon's in 1981, and also spoke more directly to adults. The episode even began with a short message stating, This program is not for young children to watch alone. In fact, this episode hasn't been seen in 35 years, until the Fred Rogers Company posted it in 2015, on the anniversary of John Lennon's death. In the episode, he urges children to express their feelings of hurt and anger, and not to bottle them up. He tells them that even he gets angry sometimes, saying, especially when I hear about people hurting other people. This episode also includes one of the most famous quotes by Mr. Rogers about looking out for helpers. When I was a boy and I would hear about something scary, somebody getting badly hurt or something like that, I'd ask my parents or my grandparents about it. And they would usually tell me how they felt about it. In fact, my mother would try to find out who was helping the person who got hurt. Always look for the people who are helping, she'd tell us. You'll always find somebody who's trying to help. So even today, when I read the newspaper and see the news on television, I look for the people who are trying to help. One of the most important parts of growing up is learning to talk and play about our feelings. Some people wonder if Mr. Rogers ever gets angry. Of course I do, especially when I hear about people hurting other people. In the world we live in today, we don't have Mr. Rogers to guide our youth, to remind adults of his teachings. However, while he may be gone, his words are never forgotten. His talks on serious issues and method of never talking down has created a lasting impact on thousands of people. The world is a better place, thanks to Fred Rogers and we truly were lucky to have him as our neighbor. You know, it happens so often. I walk down the street and someone 20 or 30 or 40 years old will come up to me and say, you are Mr. Rogers, aren't you? And then they tell me about growing up with the neighborhood and how they're passing on to the children they know what they found to be important in our television work. Like expressing their feelings through music and art and dance and sports and drama and computers and writing and, and invariably we end our little time together with a hug. I'm just so proud of all of you who have grown up with us. And I know how tough it is some days to look with hope and confidence on the months and years ahead. But I would like to tell you what I often told you when you were much younger. I like you just the way you are. It's such a good feeling to know that we're lifelong friends.